Okay. All righty. So, salvete omnes. Hello, all, and welcome to, as you know, you've just been told, learning Latin with the founding fathers. We're going to talk about this interesting smash up of Latin history, culture, all of that. So, let us jump into the fancy presentation, as I like to call them. All right. Here we are. So just as a quick note, this is kind of structured loosely, kind of off my classes that I teach. So feel free to um, shoot your digital hand up if you want. We're a small group. Ask a question about anything or a comment. Um, and we'll also have a kind of a Q&A time at the end. So uh, keep in mind if there's anything that jumps out to you as interesting or questions you might have, and we could chat about that. So without any more further ado, what the Founding Fathers can teach us about Latin. So actually, before we get super far into it, I want to briefly pray and do the Lord's Prayer in Latin, actually. This is something that the founders probably would have known about because it was very, very common in that time. Either the Latin or the English, which we have here in the 1611 authorized King James Bible translation, as that was the most common one in the United States at that time. So let us um, briefly pray, Oremus, and then we will get going further. Paternoster quies in chilis sanctific ceternomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum. Fiat voluntas tua sicut in chilo et in terra. Canum nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos demetimus debitoribus nostris. And in in ducas in temptationem, se libra nos amala. Heavenly Father God, thank you for this group, for this webinar. Um, help us all to learn well and to go smoothly and glorify you in all that we say, do, and learn. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. So that is our brief foray into culture, and then it continues into Rome. We all have a mental image that comes to mind when we think about ancient Rome. It might be the Colosseum, other cool architecture, gladiators, or your favorite Roman myth, as you may have one. It could be a range of things such as the epic poetry that came out of Rome, or the histories, or Roman law, which ended up becoming a very influential idea in the West. In short, we have our era of flourishing of ancient Rome, for that is where our story here begins with our Latin speaking. This painting kind of gives you a picture of what it might have been like in the great, grand thriving of a cultural empire. But as we all know, as happy as Colosseums and who knows, eating honey pancakes and all the happy Roman things are, eventually things have to fall. And so did Rome. And of course, as you may know, in AD 476, Rome fell and we have our desolate scene before us, the moss creeping up over all of our lovely former marble things. Uh, I don't know how historically accurate this is, but I like the depiction. It feels that Rome is gone. Yet while the city and thriving we call ancient Rome has fallen, the influence of Latin remains. In fact, Latin continued on through the Middle Ages, through the church at the time, through people like Thomas Aquinas or Bernard of Clairvaux, where Latin was the language of intellectual thought and philosophy and theology. And that continued through the Renaissance with the rebirth of all the fine cultural arts and everyone decided, hey, Latin is cool. Let's write in really long, fancy Latin sentences again. And went right back to classical Rome. And Latin continued beyond that into the Reformation, a critical event as we're gonna find for President's Day and the founding of America. And in fact, the influence of Latin even continued to the late 1700s in the United States of America, or soon to be United States of America. It's with this grand scheme of things that we now come to Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson, you should know, was a man fond of Latin riddles, from what I can tell. Here he is, or here is his, his handwriting, which I am still attempting to fully make out as reading in cursive is not necessarily my strong suit sometimes. We have his, his lovely riddle here on the side and my attempts at figuring out some of what he has written. Some of the lines, for example, include mare miscet pisquis, 
the sea mingles with fish, as far as I can make out. We also have our chunk here toward the end that I can start to make out, this handwriting. Equus est in stabulo et non est. A horse is in the stable, and it is not. And of course, my personal favorite. Caipe saipe sub saipe crescuit. An onion often grows under a hedge. I do not know what his intent was with these riddles. I do not know why onions, of all things. I like onions. Perhaps he did as well. I have not yet gotten that far in my research to find out his root vegetable preferences. However, I thought this was an interesting outpouring of his Latin knowledge. And he didn't stop with this page, but also wrote another two pages of riddles with handwriting that is perhaps even more, dare we say, almost not quite chicken scratchy, but a little close to it. Can't quite fully make it out again, but we have this one very cryptic line, et eris ut ego nunc, and you will be that I am now. These then are some of his handwritten papers found among all his many papers that have been saved through the ages for us to gaze upon today. So that's where now we've seen his interest in Latin. We're going to transition into Thomas Jefferson. 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 There we go. I don't know why I'm pronouncing things curiously. Thomas Jefferson, the Renaissance man. We all kind of know maybe that he is the drafter of the Declaration of Independence and all as well as the Trade Commissioner and U.S. Minister to France the first Secretary of State, and the third President of the United States. But we don't talk as often about his interests in linguistics and in languages. In his work, Notes on Virginia, which was basically a questionnaire he was filling out to send to France so that the French would support the United States during the Revolutionary War, he talked about a bunch of things. It's almost things he was interested in. He would talk about the geography, then go into his opinions on education. Just talking about his favorite subjects, apparently, which one of them was language in education of early America. He thought there was a need for education in languages, both ancient and modern, to prevent young citizens' minds from becoming lethargic and impotent. impotent. And he also believed, interestingly, that language was a way to trace a nation's roots. That is to say, he was interested in what linguists use the fancy term philology. For J.R.R. Tolkien lovers out there, Tolkien was also into philology and this idea of comparing historical languages and how they developed. And so Thomas Jefferson pursued these interests in his snazzy study in library. I don't know about you, but I would love to have a study in library this nice with lots of books. It looks very beautiful and very cozy. And so it is here that we can picture him sitting, scratching out these Latin riddles or doing other foreign language studies. It seems that Jefferson's linguistic knowledge and interest in languages was even beyond average. And at the time, he said in a letter, I was educated at William and Mary College in Williamsburg. I read Greek, Latin, French, Italian, Spanish, and English, of course. Um, something of its radix, the Anglo-Saxon. He studied a broad smattering of languages, not just Latin, but a host of others as well. So we're going to briefly talk about Thomas Jefferson learning Latin as he's written about himself. He enjoyed reading Greco-Roman classics. You can picture him happily engaging in it at Monticello. To read the Greek and Latin authors in the original is a sublime luxury. And I deem luxury in science to be at least as justifiable as in architecture, painting, gardening, or the other arts. I thank on my knees him who directed my early education for having put into my possession, possession this rich source of delight. And I would not exchange it for anything which I could then have acquired. In short, Jefferson greatly appreciated his knowledge of ancient and dead languages, such as Greek and Latin. And he was also very interested in his grandson's education, as you might imagine. He wrote in his letter about his grandson's Latin study habits. 
he could only afford time before breakfast for keeping up his Latin, but he has done more than that, being sensibly improved his knowledge of the construction of the language. He'll need about two more years of that and then go into Greek so as to pursue it later. Such are John Jefferson's letters about language learning. Now we're gonna we've already talked about his host of languages he knew and how he saw languages as important for young citizens to learn. Because during the time of the Revolutionary War, the newly freed United States was in kind of in a period of newness. They were developing kind of a new culture. They were now separate from Great Britain, so they wanted a new language as well to show their independence in any way possible that included in their language. Now, Jefferson shows that Lamy Latin wasn't necessarily his very favorite language because he preferred Anglo-Saxon and thought it should influence our new American English more than, say, Latin or Greek should. He felt that was the long, fancy Latinate words, like ambiguous or perspicuous, were kind of artificial, and he wanted something more natural, like Anglo-Saxon. Plus, he felt that students would imbibe principles of free government by studying Anglo-Saxon compared to other languages. Um, Noah Webster, who you guys probably recognize as being the man behind our favorite dictionary, the Webster Dictionary, um, also agreed that we need to have our own language with our new government. Um, so Jefferson basically ultimately decided that language should be determined by usage, not theoretical grammar, which is kind of how he viewed Latin and Greek, which I disagree with, but Jefferson thought that Anglo-Saxon showed the fluidity of language development and was simple and clear, perfect for the free nation of the United States. Here's a list of sources there, um, mostly very interesting reads. But with that, now that we've talked about Thomas Jefferson, we're going to talk about the world of Thomas Jefferson, the, the culture and nation that shaped him into being who he was. In short, we're going to discuss Latin education in colonial America. As we've already kind of touched on, because Latin was the lingua fran franca of, of the world, of, of the West, from since the fall of Rome, it was all the intellectual works were written in Latin, including those of the Protestant Reformation. One of the things of the Protestant Reformation, besides creating many more kind of denominations at the time, a new emphasis on education and literacy followed. Because people should be able to read the Bible for themselves, according to a lot of major reformers, such as Martin Luther, education then became important. You can't really read the Bible if you can't read. Therefore, literacy was crucial. And so those following after the Reformation, including American founders, came to believe that a literate, well-educated populace, grounded in the word of God and guided by biblical morality, was essential for political self-government. A self-governing people must be educated to make informed, intelligent decisions about how to best govern themselves. And so this emphasis on education and literacy sweeps into the colonial America and the time as our founders are learning and becoming the future founders of America. They are immersed in this emphasis on literacy. And just as your kind of random fun fact, Latin was also involved, even with the American colony, from the very beginning. Because Christopher Columbus's journeys were translated from Spanish into Latin at the time so that more people could read about them and his ideas about where this new America was. Well, now we're getting into further into our American history here. Now we're getting into the Boston Latin School founded in 1635, which was all about the humanities. And basically it was supposed to be a school that taught Latin and Greek, which it of course did. Eventually its headmaster became a very famous Latin grammar author Ezekiel Cheever, which is kind of a fun name. Um, and of course, there was a lot of Latin studying. And then in the winter, it was not unusual for the boys at the Boston Latin School to bring their sleds and then coast down the street, down Beacon Street, across Tremont, and down the school street. 
interestingly, this is one, this is the longest standing um, and first public school in America, actually. And so the Boston Latin School has endured from 1635 until today. And that's just a school. When it comes to more upper level courses, that leads us to Harvard. Harvard was also kind of founded around a similarly early time for the advancement of good literature, arts, and sciences. At the time, we'll note that Latin was the language of instruction, although um, the requirement wasn't really renewed in 1692. Students were expected to be well-versed in their Latin and then do a course, a bunch of Latin and Greek and Hebrew studies. The examination of classical languages through histories and drama, providing the base for scholarly pursuits. That is, at the time, the understanding was that this education and knowledge of these dead languages was crucial for pursuing these other subjects. It was the key, the gateway, so to speak, to really understanding these other works. Um, Samuel Eliot Morrison, um, writing at the time about Harvard College in the 17th century, talks about these two poems in the 1650s that were written by Native American students. These are actually the only surviving Latin by Native Americans. Since they went there, had to write poems, presumably, and these are the only ones that have survived. In short, Latin literacy flourished throughout colonial America and even before, as well as somewhat after, as we will see. So, because of the education, it leads us to Latin founding fathers, Latin scholars. Or, shall we say, we're going to look at Thomas Jefferson's colleagues. Just to further tie in the Latin point, colleague is from the middle French collègue, or well, my French, my middle French pronunciation is not good. Um, this word, which is from the Latin collega, which is basically a compound Latin word com or con, which is kind of like with or intensifying, and legare to depute, which is this kind of, um, I had to look up the word depute, and then I promptly forgot it, unfortunately. But you get that sense of kind of coming together and kind of thinking, working together, and that is in the Latin word colleague. You'll see our quote here um, from Daniel Dreisbach, who talks about how the men who signed Declaration of Independence, not just Jefferson, um, were, they were highly educated, especially by standards of the day. Approximately half were college educated, which meant they were fluent in Latin and could read Greek. Other founding fathers could knew other languages. Thomas Paine, for example, famous for, wait, I'm spacing now, but Thomas Paine, for example, was able to speak well in French. French was actually a very common denominator, which makes sense given the role of France and the United States kind of during this time period and during the Revolutionary War. And so now we're going to look more specifically at some of Thomas Jefferson's colleagues. First up, we have Benjamin Franklin, who you probably have heard as a man of many interests. I mean, we all kind of know of him of being the guy who decided it'd be a good idea in the name of science to fly a kite during a thunderstorm as the legend goes, to learn about electricity. However, he was also a diplomat to France. He helped craft and sign the Declaration of Independence, and he was among the delegates for the Constitutional Convention. And of course, in his autobiography, he talks about his language education. I have already mentioned that I had only one year's instruction in a Latin school, and that one very young, after which I neglected that language entirely. But when I had attained an acquaintance with the French, Italian, and Spanish, I was surprised to find, on looking over a Latin testament, that I understood so much more of that language than I had imagined, which encouraged me to apply myself again to the study of it, and I met with more success, as those preceding languages have greatly smoothed my way. Franklin's interesting in that he advocated for starting with modern languages first and then going to Latin which is an interesting perspective, given that Latin can also help learn other foreign languages as well. Or you can learn two at the same time, which is what I actually did, was learn French and Latin simultaneously. A 
Of course, besides Ben Franklin, we had other figures like John Adams and John Quincy. John Adams was very invested in young John Quincy's education. Um, he had a lot of paternal wisdom and wanted to make sure his son got to read his favorite Latin authors. You go on, I presume, with your Latin exercises, and I wish to hear of your beginning upon Sallust, who is one of the most polished and perfect of the Roman historians, every period of whom, and I have said almost every syllable and every letter, is worth studying. In company with Sallust, Cicero, Tacitus, and Livy, you will learn wisdom and virtue. You will see them represented with all the charms which language and imagination can exhibit, and vice and folly painted in all their deformity and horror. You will ever remember that all the end of study is to make you a good man and a useful citizen. This will ever um, let's see. Uh, why, sorry. This will ever be the total of the advice of your affectionate father. This passage is striking because not only does John Adams mention all of his favorite Latin authors, he also connects it with learning virtue and being a virtuous citizen capable of self-government. It's that theme we saw earlier where education and literacy were seen as being important for being self-governing citizens, which is what kind of the founders grew up with that understanding and they continue to kind of propagate that idea, that connection between education, literacy, the classics, and what that meant for self-government. Also interesting in that John Adams writes with a lot of kind of parallel ideas, kind of pairing these, our wisdom, our virtue, pairing our, our charms and our imagination, vice and folly, deformity and horror. He's pairing these ideas in a very kind of parallel construction, which kind of suggests maybe some Latin influence, even on how he wrote and composed his rhetoric, his rhetorical flair. Besides John Adams and young John Quincy, we have, of course, George Washington. No presentation dealing with founding fathers can be complete without talking about the most well-known and illustrious George Washington. He, however, never actually received a formal education due to his father's death. Unlike his older brothers, who got to have a very kind of classical Latin-based education that aligned well with, say, what John Adams would have wanted for John Quincy, Washington's study was much more kind of self-directed and just reading a lot. However, he ended up, as we all know, becoming the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War the delegate to the Constitutional Convention, when the Articles of Confederation were causing kind of chaos among the um, confederated state nations, almost, um, so to speak. He was also the first president, as we all know. There is no indication that George Washington ever studied Latin himself. However, even he was influenced profoundly by like the Latin language. So he was actually awarded several honorary Latin diplomas for a doctor of laws. Um, he also, of course, in being a famous and popular person, had many busts made of him, of his head and upper torso. And this gentleman, Marron de Montmontel, proposed a number of Latin phrases or French phrases for putting onto the bust. Um, we have that picture up here on our top right is kind of a list of some of his ideas. One of them is here, hoc Cincinnati brutuque in marmore vertus spirat in hoc fabii, provida clara simul. Which, of course, can kind of roughly translates to virtue, virtus, as you can tell. Interestingly, it's connected to the Latin word vir, which means man. So there's kind of this connection of, at least in the Latin language, of this kind of man and being kind of a virtuous person. Virtue bereaves. Here we kind of see things like perspire or in similar words in Spiro. We can think of some English derivatives. Virtue breathes. On this marble, this um, of, of Cincinnatus and of Brutus, 
and on the same one of Fabius. Prudent, at the same time, bright, illustrious. Um, there's kind of a host of different words you can kind of use for Clara, but they all deal with this kind of illustrious brightness, esteemedness. Um, and besides these, um, okay, so first of all, we're actually going to talk about these three Roman men that Washington is compared to on the next slide. It's an interesting comparison that really shows how Roman history and Latin have informed the founding, so we can kind of understand a bit better why this French guy is comparing Washington to these Roman guys. So we'll get there in a moment. For that, though, we have one more piece of Latin literature, this letter to the President of the United States of America, which was sent from Eb this gentleman named our Ebenezer, who wrote it in Latin. I do not know how George Washington necessarily understood it. I presume someone must have known Latin to help him through it. But here we have a letter in Latin that was sent to the president. Now, we talked about Cincinnatus, Brutus, and Fabius, which suggests that the question, is George Washington a Roman hero? We're going to briefly talk about these three figures. First of all, we have Cincinnatus. He was appointed dictator of Rome temporarily in 458 BC. And you should know that the term dictator is from a Latin verb, dico dicere, which means like to speak, to say. And it's ending, ator. It kind of means like someone who does a thing. A dictator is literally one who speaks. That's why an orator is someone who kind of prays or begs, literally. Although it's more of like a rhetoric. Um, synonym for someone who does speeches as well. Or an amateur. An amateur photographer, for example, is someone who loves to do a certain thing. That's why they're not a professional, they're an amateur because they do it for the love of the thing. Dictator is kind of the same type of word, one who speaks. And it was kind of a position, as I recall, in the, among the Roman levels of power in the Republic. And so Cincinnati was appointed dictator temporarily. And he kept his authority just long enough so he could rescue a con the consular army from the Aquian tribe who were in Gaul. And once he had rescued the army and the Republic was safe, he famously returned to his plow. He was someone who kind of represented the loyalty to the patria, to the fatherland. He was literally patriotic and loyal in seeking the welfare of the country without wanting a bunch of power to himself. Interestingly, that leads right into our next guy, Brutus. And you probably may have heard of Brutus because of Julius Shakespeare's famous heart-rending et tu, Brute, when Julius Caesar, who was dictator for life, began to seem too much like a king and had too much possibility for power in the Roman Republic. And so he was a threat to it. And so Brutus kind of led up the conspiracy to assassinate Julius Caesar to prevent him from kind of dissolving the Republic. Unfortunately, the death of Caesar really did kind of mark the end of the Republic as there was kind of a lot of kind of warfare and power struggles that then led to the first actual emperor, the Emperor Augustus. And so it's interesting that Brutus is one of the comparisons here, but I think that's because he was committed to preserving the Roman Republic. And finally, we have Fabius Cunctator. Cunctator literally means the delayer. And I think at first, this name Cunctator was kind of meant to um, kind of make fun of or reflect badly on our friend Fabius down here, because his warfare strategy didn't exactly please the Romans, who wanted more fighting. Now! Hurry! And Cunctator and our friend Fabius Contactor was, of course, a delayer. He is important because his strategy kind of roughly um, can be compared to actually George Washington's because both of them had forces that were much smaller than who they were fighting. And so instead of directly engaging in warfare immediately, it was more of a long, extended um, process of wearing down larger enemy, tiring them out to eventually win. And Fabius Cunctator did, as I recall, eventually come out triumphant. 
with the strategy. And as we know, George Washington also kind of threw, after many years of having difficulty and not really winning very much in the Revolutionary War, also came out on as the victors. So we kind of have some similar themes here of kind of loyalty, preserving kind of the Republic among these Roman men that are compared in this um, bust description, this phrase for it. And finally, because George Washington was so popular, he actually has two biographies written in Latin about him. And they both have very similar names. Washingtonii Vita and Georgi Washingtonis Vita by um, these two different authors, both written and published in 1835. Both literally mean life of Washington or life of George Washington. And here we have our beautiful first page of Latin. Civitates Americanae Septentrionales a Principio Coloniae Ferrurum. Fer ah, the states of like Northern America from the beginning were colonies. And then uh, it kind of goes on. This is a translation from Library of Congress as well. It talks about, you know, they're formerly 13 in number. Now in 1835, we have 24 states. They used to be separate and now they're together. And so it just kind of continues. One of the interesting things about this is that 1835 is so many centuries after like classical Roman, classical Latin. And so there is going to be kind of change and kind of new words. Like this word septentrionales is not really a familiar word. I don't think it's a common word if you're reading really old Latin writing before Christ or slightly after the year of our Lord. And so you get this kind of linguistic change as well. It is somewhat fluid as far as its development. Oh, this is nearing the end of Latin as being the popular language. So then, beyond these document, these, there we go, biographies, we're now going to briefly jump into Latin documents that shaped America. You've already had some names kind of mentioned or in famous figures. Now we're going to actually look at some of these documents. First up, we're going to briefly touch on just generally influential authors. One of the most important was actually just the Bible, especially either the um, 1611 authorized King James or the Geneva Bible. They actually have been kind of quoted a lot in many of the founding speeches or by early founding fathers. They were some of the most quoted in, in its language. And so I, it would be remiss for me not to mention that the, the ubiquity, the common presence of references to the King James Bible in this time. We also, of course, have some Enlightenment era thinkers on natural law and other um, different, different law legal works, essentially. It'd be a great time to go further into kind of how what Roman law's influence was in Enlightenment thinkers like Montesquieu or Blackstone or John Locke or David Hume. But I don't actually know a lot about that as of yet. But I think there's definitely kind of some building on the works from ancient Rome. That's kind of how the ideas progress, is people write out their intellectual history, people add onto it, add onto it. And that's kind of how things are dialogued about, they're conversed in writing, and that kind of leads to intellectual change and new ideas. We got Plutarch down there, who's kind of a more of a really a Greek, but did write about Roman figures like Julius Caesar. And so we can be sure that the founders were familiar with the story of Julius Caesar, his relationship to the Republic of Rome and how it ended as well. Um, Cato the Elder is also an interesting guy. He's really famous for not liking Carthage during a time toward the Punic Wars in ancient Rome. This is where we had our elephants and Hannibal's great idea to set elephants over the mountains and take them on a hike. And it worked at first. And so they were from Carthage and Cato did not like Carthage at all. And so he famously said, Cartago de Lenda Est, Carthage must be destroyed. And just as a footnote of history, Carthage did end up being destroyed, I think around like a hundred 
46 BC or so, they destroyed it, burned it, and sprinkled salt everywhere so that it would be infertile and the soil would be ruined because of all the salt. Well, it's a very salty town. Um, and so that's kind of our key figures here, just as a scope of history, seeing the building progression and ancient authors like Cato and Plutarch. With that said, now we're going to look at some particular figures. First, we're going to look at Sallust, because John Adams loved him so much as to tell John Quincy to make sure he read him. Look at the syllables. Look at the letters. He's amazing. So we're going to kick off with this gentleman, who, of course, also lived around the time of Julius Caesar. Um, he was in... Oh, let's see. He was kind of involved in some of the political actions. He was in the Senate, and then he was expelled because he liked Julius Caesar too much. Um, he returned to civic life to be a provincial governor of Numidia. Um, let's see, which is kind of like you can kind of the African African area of um, the ancient world in the Roman Empire. When he returned to Rome, he retired from politics around time of Julius Caesar's assassination, and devoted himself to writing the Catalinian War and another war that are among the earliest historical monographs written in Latin. Um, St. Augustine, who's a cool guy, would later go on to praise Sallust as being a historian of ennobled truthfulness. I don't know if that's necessary, if I necessarily agree with Augustine, but I haven't read enough of him to tell yet. And so we have our opening quote to give you a taste of Sallust. Like a lot of Greco-Roman historians, he loved philosophy. You could not have a history book without having some nice dose of hefty philosophy in the beginning to kick it off. And so he writes, It becomes all men who desire to excel other animals, to strive to the utmost of their power, not to pass through life in obscurity, like the beasts of the field, which nature has formed groveling and subservient to appetite. All our power is situated in the mind and in the body. Of the mind we rather employ the government, of the body the service. The one is common to us with the good, with the gods, the other with the brutes. It appears to me therefore more reasonable to pursue glory by means of the intellect than of bodily strength. And since the life we enjoy is short, to make the remembrance of us as lasting as possible. For the glory of wealth and beauty is fleeting and perishable. That of intellectual power is illustrious and immortal. This is the opening to his history of the Catalinian War which is possibly one of the most interesting episodes in early Roman history. Again, kind of around this time of kind of like 60s, 50s BC, we had Catiline's conspiracy to overthrow the Roman government, burn it down, and some other scheming ploys that he had. He was opposed in the Senate by Cicero, who heard of the plot and decided to make a now famous speech about it. In which he said, Quo usque abutere Catalina, patientia nostra. How long, Catalina, will you abuse our patience? He goes on to talk about how Catalina is sitting in the Senate that he plotted to destroy, so calmly plotting the deaths of all in Rome. And then Cicero also famously laments, O mores, O tempora, O morals, O times, that they have led to such a conspiracy like this. And so in this brief episode of conspiracy, you have again that kind of tension of the republic and the political powers at play. And it's a story that I think our founders would have known well. They probably have read this introduction to Sallust, who goes on to talk about Cicero versus Catiline and the, the threat to the republic. And so it's kind of an important thing just to briefly note this this likely this history that they so likely would have known about and had in the back of their minds as they were founding the United States of America. That is Sallust. Now we're going to jump way into the future from 50 BC all the way up to 1215 AD. The Magna the Magna Carta. Which I learned is actually just called Magna Carta. You don't need a the in front of it because that's more of an English translation thing. But because we're talking about it in Latin, it's just Magna Carta, kind of like the Great Charter, you could call it, maybe, in English. So Magna Carta was presented to King John to curb his royal excesses of authority. Um, it's a popular document because in its idea, 
it represented liberty and rights of the people, which the founders were seeking. Um, its, its legacy especially lingers in the Bill of Rights. Um, and this is a, let's see, history.com article, I think. Early Americans, the Magna Carta and Declaration of Independence were verbal representations of what liberty was and what government should be. Protecting people rather than oppressing them, says John Kaminsky, who's the director of the Center for the Study of the American Constitution. A slight bit of a mouthful there. Much in the same way that for the last 100 years, the Statue of Liberty has been a visual representation of freedom, liberty, prosperity, and welcoming. So there's this key idea of representing liberty and representing the government that the founders envisioned. There are two clauses in particular that were important in Magna Carta, number 39 and number 40. Um, we're probably not going to spend the whole time just reading Latin words here. This one's kind of a long one. But you can probably already pick out some words like imprisonator. You can probably guess what that means. It's going to be kind of be imprisoned. Um, is necessary and no free man be seized or be imprisoned or be um, kind of removed from any liberty that he kind of is holding his own, et cetera, et cetera. You get this repetition, though, of liber, libero, liberta, libertatibus, liberis, and et cetera, which you can kind of, as you would think, is where we get our word liberty, this idea of the liber, the libertas, um, the free man, the freedom. Um, you also note down here in the bottom, we have our lovely word, um, lex legis, legale, which is, of course, you'd imagine kind of where we get legal. It's right there in the word, and even ju um, judi judicium, judicium. You can kind of picture it. it. Sounds kind of like judge, justice, a host of similar words there. And again, we have legum. Kind of sounds like legal. You can see some Latin words that you might not know, but you actually do know them because English is so based off of Latin. <clears throat> we also have number forty. Nole vendimus, noli negabimus, aut differemus rectum vel justi justitiam. We will sell to no one. We will deny to no one or um, kind of um, like remove from the right or the just. Which more smoothly translated here, um, we have both 39. No free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any other way. Nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so except by lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. And number 40, which we just looked at, to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay the right, like the right thing or justice. And James Madison actually talks about number 40, in one of the Federalist Papers, where he wrote, Justice is the end of government. It is the end of civil society. It has been and ever will be pursued until it be obtained or until liberty be lost in the pursuit. Interestingly, again, tying back into kind of Magna Carta and role in America, we have, interestingly, a ceremony of when the Magna Carta arrived in the Capitol Rotunda in 1976. I'm always appreciative of nice British uniforms, and so here you go, you can take your fill of an interesting photo that I was not aware of until preparing this presentation. But there you go, ceremony for the arrival of the Magna Carta. And now we're going to briefly talk about Latin in America today. We've seen kind of the role of Latin and Roman history in shaping the founders, their education, their literacy in the Latin language. And now we're gonna see kind of what lingers today. Explicitly, wait, wait, oops, very specifically today, we have, of course, our coinage, which has a pluribus unum all over it. It's been there since like 1807, where we had kind of our earliest coins proclaiming a pluribus unum up kind of through today. A pluribus unum, as you may know, is kind of Latin for from many one or even one out of many. We have a preposition here, a or x, um, from, many, kind of sounds like plural, pluribus, plurais, that idea of a plurality of many 
and of course unum one unity or uno for all my uno fans out there so a player was unum was actually kind of the unofficial united states motto for a long time until i think the 1950s when in god we trust became the actual official motto of the united states however the latin motto influence remains still in the state mottos these are not all the state mottos that have latin in them but they're some of my favorites also we have things like in alabama aldemus yura nostra defendere we dare to maintain our rights or arizona a nice simple ditat deus god enriches a nice um kind of greco-roman philosophy sounding one from arkansas which I left the S off of. Um, Regnat populus, the people rule. Uh, we have Kansas is kind of, I think, more well known, like ad astra per aspera, to the stars through difficulties. Massachusetts has a really long one. Ense petit placidam sub libertate quietam. By the sword we seek peace, but peace only under liberty. And Michigan, which is my favorite state motto ever. Si quires peninsulam aimoinam circum spice. If you seek a pleasant peninsula, look about you. I love that one. And of course, we have Virginia, which is kind of famous. Six semper tyrannis. Thus, always to tyrant, tyrants. Include this one partly because it was quoted by John Wilkes Booth during the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. It's also the state model of Virginia, and that might be a quote from something as well. Interestingly, I did not know until now, but the District of Columbia also has a motto, and it is in Latin, Justitia Omnibus, Justice for All. These are some kind of state mottos, not all, but some, that involve a Latin or a Latin phrase. Oh, why does it keep going back? My apologies. Um, here we go. So, now... Through this kind of quick jog through Roman and kind of Reformation and early American history, we've looked at kind of the founding fathers of America and how they interacted with Latin, how they studied Latin, kind of what they knew and how their reading and their education shaped them to go on to shape the nation of the United States of America as we know it today. And so that is all I really have for you guys. Um, here is our lovely philosophical painting, School of Athens. Um, it is with this that I ask if you have questions or comments. But thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. It was. And so now I guess questions, if you have any. Sarah, how did you get interested in Latin? Okay, let's see. I actually was not initially interested in Latin. I was, you know, I'm a homeschool graduate. And because I'm a homeschooler, you kind of do Latin. That's kind of like the thing you do. And I was not very into it at first. <laughs> didn't really like it, didn't get it. Um, once I hit 10th grade, I had a really good Latin teacher. And I just started to uh, get more, like, enjoy. I guess his kind of enthusiasm kind of was... I guess contagious and I found I kind of started to get it and it made sense and just really enjoyed languages and like communicating in them so it's kind of the start of it and it just continued because the more you can re actually read stuff in Latin the kind of the more fun it is to actually go wow I can understand what they're saying in this other language and it's kind of a cool experience so that was big for me yeah does anybody else have a question Okay, who's your favorite president? Oh, that's a difficult one. I'm not sure. I love Thomas Jefferson, though, because he's just so much fun to read about when mm -hmm. it comes to his language study. Like, I, it's so fascinating, like, what he's into, like, riddles and Anglo-Saxon and starting the first college that taught Anglo-Saxon in America mm -hmm. for a short time and it ended, ended kind of disastrously. Yeah. So Jefferson's good. Yeah. What about everybody else? Who's everybody's favorite president? Any, anybody have a favorite? Nobody has a favorite president. I do. Who, who is it? 
Uh, let's see. Probably either George Washington or John Adams. I think he was a president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. Nice picks. Yeah. Have you been able to go to Mount Vernon? Has anybody gone to see George Washington's birthplace? It is such a great it field trip. I mean, it is so, the gardens alone are amazing, but just to be in a house that he was in, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Oh, Abraham Lincoln. Okay, that's a good one. Love Abe. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anybody else? Can I just ask you guys, are you guys all Latin students? Has everybody here studied Latin at least a little bit? Yeah. I know the Grandes have and the Lundgrens have. Emma and Haley, have you? I did a little bit, but Haley hasn't. Okay. Do you like Latin? Yeah, I think it's very interesting and fun. Cool. So, Haley, are you looking forward to starting Latin at some point soon? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, awesome. Good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Josie said she loves Abraham Lincoln. He's so active on the internet these days. <laughs> There's all those memes about Abe Lincoln. Everything you believe, everything you read on the internet is true, which is, you know, obviously he's not with us anymore. So, well, you guys, thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thank you for an interesting presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, if you guys have any questions or want to um, talk to Sarah about Latin or history or anything else, we would love to just chat with you for a few minutes. Um, I'm going to just turn off the